It's a real pleasure to have uh, with us today Brian Riley, who holds over 30 years of the history of the Massachusetts halfway houses. And not only that, but also the process of a movement that actually was trying to move away from institutions and into the communities as prisoners were released. We are going to visit the history. Thank you for being with us. And uh, one of my first question is, just going back to the beginnings of this okay. process. The Massachusetts Halfway House Houses was incorporated on September 28, 1964. That's what I was Correct. Uh, finding in the papers. Another time, Mr. Kevin White was the Secretary of the Commonwealth. Just to, just, just a historical anecdote there. So, what moved the founders to uh, have this process incorporated and work, work it as a business? Uh, I think my understanding, because uh, I wasn't here then, but my understanding is that uh, Bob Burt, Reverend Robert Burt, in Walpole State Prison, uh, and his um, inmate assistant, Murdoch McDonald, um, thought about uh, all the people who leave Walpole and all the people who return after a brief stay in the community. And so they uh, came up with the idea of a halfway house, but it was predicated on the Federal Bureau of Prisons at that time had started uh, halfway houses, but they called them pre-release guidance centers. And they opened three, New York City, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Uh, I had the fortune to work uh, in New York City for Springfield College, which ran that center. Uh, so they took that idea and thought it would be a great thing to do at a local level, a state level, as opposed to a federal level. One of the things that kind of surprised me as I saw the incorporation paper from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is to actually see that there was kind of a group of people that, it was a, it was a large group of people that were interested in this process. Uh, among those names I could uh, see here, Daniel Finn, Sidney Menk, John Driscoll, uh, Albert Danielson, Erwin Canham, and Ruben Laurie, Endicott Peabody, Francis Gray, John Wolp, Anson Phelps Stokes, Robert Burt, Edward Proctor, Bernard Pearson, Harry Finman, Ray Goodman, Kenneth Lloyd Garrison, John Frenning, George McGrath, Howard Jocelyn, and Joseph Ambrose. What is interesting though that running the 1960s where prisoners were kind of a population that was seen without much interest by the general population, actually was a stigma on prisoners. Uh, who were these people? Why, why were they interested in the life of prisoners? Uh, I think uh, that's an interesting question because Bob Burt reached out to Sidney Mink, who was the uh, reverend of the Good Shepherd Church around the corner, as I've told you, uh, and they reached out to some significant and important individuals in the Commonwealth. Uh, you've named them. Uh, they were all substantial people in their own way. Uh, Joe Ambrose was a general. Uh, he also eventually ran the uh, National Guard in Massachusetts. Uh, he was a major general doing that. He was a colonel in a regular army. Um, and so forth. And then they reached out further to find other supporters. Uh, and one of those significant supporters at the time was uh, William Coolidge, who, uh, without whom I don't think mass halfway houses would have ever survived and developed. Um, so they um, helped us deal with the politics, uh, the finances, uh, and f helped us find facilities that we could start our programs in. The first halfway house that was established was the Brook House, which uh, was located at 79 Chandler Street, is correct. that correct? Correct, South End. Uh, and, but it was a rented space on the third floor of that building. Your first client was accepted 
and only in November 17, 1965. So this is when you actually not know when the first client came in, but much way before that, when you actually began your career at MHHI and your influence. Can you tell us about how is it that you came in to MHHI and where you started your work and how did you actually get to actually get this uh, Brookhouse uh, program in, in Chandler Street? Sure. Uh, I was working in New York, as I said, mm -hmm. with, with Springfield College running the f federal program in New York. Actually, we were in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, my wife and I decided we wanted to return home to New England. Uh, within a matter of weeks, uh, Bob Burt, uh, Chaplain Burt, and uh, Chaplain from around the corner, who became the first president of Mass Halfway Houses Board, visited us in New York to talk about what is a halfway house, how do you do it, what are you doing, so forth. And in our conversation uh, came up the fact that I was leaving the New York facility to return home. I uh, didn't have a job, actually, but we were going to come back anyway. And they asked me to consider being the first director. So that's that connection to come here. Uh, my first office was in Sidney Mink's office. He gave me a chair and a table to work on. We wrote a proposal that the board approved of uh, and submitted it for funding uh, to a number of foundations. But the Boston Foundation was the key foundation. Uh, we got funding from them, I believe, because William Coolidge called up their board president and told them he was interested in doing this. Uh, at the same time, uh, Brookhouse was owned uh, by the Episcopal Church. It had been a, from 1900, it had been a home for women moving to Boston from the countryside. Uh, supervised kind of living arrangement, then they went out of business, uh, and then somehow the Episcopal Diocese owned, became the owner. Uh, it also turns out that William Coolidge was very active in the Episcopal Diocese and active in fundraising for them. So he got them to give us the right of refers refusal for the first ownership. Uh, so I went around trying to raise money to buy a building. It was $75,000, which was an awful lot of money in those days, saying we started with $1,700 here. Uh, and so uh, Mary Sargent, who was his secretary, uh, I called her, I think my... Uh, option ended on Monday. So I called Mary Sargent on Friday and I said, we don't have two nickels to rub together. So on Monday, I don't know where we're going to move the idea to. She said, Brian, just relax. I said, how can I relax? I'm going to be on the street on Monday. Uh, she said, Bill Coolidge bought the building for you. So have your attorney, Brian, uh, talk to our attorney. And whatever arrangements you want, uh, fine with Bill. So, actually she referred to him as Willie. Uh, so that's how we wound up owning Brookhouse. This, this only happened though by 1968. That is three years since you came in here, right? Because you, before, according to the history, you were renting space there, right? We were renting space at, at Brookhouse. Right, so by 1968, it says that uh, it became the property of MHHI. You are full-time staff, by then was four, and your budget exceeded $100,000. Now, going from a $1,700 right. to $100,000 in three years, can you tell me how you managed to do this? Uh, again, uh, William Coolidge uh, paved the way. When, it, when He was a very, very important, influential man in the financial community. Uh, he made a few calls. Uh, they f gave us money. Uh, and that's how we arrived at that. And then we started to get contracts. Uh, slowly but surely we got contracts, but Bill Coolidge's, and I'll give you a, a simple example. Um, we didn't have enough money to pay some bills, and so I would talk to Mary Sargent almost daily. 
and she would keep Bill Coolidge uh, uh, informed of what was going on. And she would say to me, don't worry, Bill's just sent you a check for $5,000. So that literally, he not only bought the building for me, but he, every time I was broke, he'd come up with another 5000 But his idea was not to make it easy, but to make it a business, because he was a businessman. Absolutely. So he gave me enough to survive, but not enough to get comfortable. And that's how we did it. And then when the contract started coming in, it was much easier. You know, thinking that you started with uh, only one client uh, in 1965. I even know that client's name. You do. That's excellent. What? What is? Can you read? Bob Offley. Okay, thank Came you. Came out of Concord Prison. Is he still alive? He still. Uh, well, he, I don't know, but he eventually became a fireman in Boston. Got married, had some children, and retired. So from one, from that one client to. Uh, owning the building in 1968. How many clients did you have by then, approximately? I think at that time, uh, we were probably running with between 20 and 30 clients. Also in uh, 1968, MHHI established the first chartered credit union for ex-offenders. Right. Now, what th this was... Federally chartered. This was... That's correct. Now, this was pioneering at that time. Correct. Because nobody actually would think of having a credit union for ex-offenders. Right. How did this idea come up uh, to be? I had a friend who was an elk, and he invited me to go to some event at the Elks, my wife and I. So we went, and the guy sitting across from me, his job was to create credit unions. So we got to started talking. And one thing led to another. I told him that's a great idea because one of the things ex-offenders need is credit. The society functions on credit. And of course, one of the things nobody's going to give you is credit if you're an ex-offender. So he and I got chatting and talking, and he helped me do the paperwork. And file. We then, then, of course, the deal was you have a federal charter or a state charter. And they're somewhat different, and the state charters are much looser. So he and I decided we shouldn't be loose. We should be as tight as we can. So we'll do the federal charter and see what happened. Uh, surprise of surprise, uh, we got the federal charter to create a credit union. Now, my idea was to tie that into our program, which including a savings mm -hmm. model. So, and to develop credit, uh, if you come out of prison, you don't have anything, right? You don't have clothes, you don't have... So, the first thing we would want you to do is open uh, your um, account at the credit union, which you would, and then you put a lot of money in there week to week as you worked and saved, and then you needed some new underwear, or you needed a new shirt. We didn't want you to pay cash. What we wanted you to do is go to the credit union and get a loan which you would repay quickly. So if you do a number of these things over time, you now have uh, several loans that you've repaid, right? You bought the, whatever the things were that you needed to buy, but if you now went somewhere else and said, I'd like a credit card, let's say, they would say one of the things you have to prove is that you're credit, credit worthy. Well, you had a credit reference at the credit union. And all we used was Federal Credit Union, whatever the number was, which I don't remember, as your reference point. It didn't say it was a credit union for ex -fenders. It said it was Federal Credit Union number. And they would call and say, what about Brian Riley? Is he a good credit risk? And he said, they would pull out my file and say, well, Brian's had five loans. He's paid them all back on time. Uh, and yeah, we would consider him a great credit risk. That would then lead to a credit outside. So that would then, if you played it right, could snowball into having credit. That program ran for many years. Yes. But eventually was discontinued. Right. Why was this? And just a follow-up question so we can talk about the same subject right away. 
How do prisoners do it these days? I have no clue how they do but, it. But let's see what first, why is it that Damage Chai decided to discontinue the credit union? Uh, you know, I can't answer that either because that happened after my time. It wasn't discontinued while I was here. So it was discontinued after 1997? Right. Okay. Well, we'll ask those who discontinue that why they did it. Uh, well, by the way, uh, just to follow up with the credit union. Yes. Uh, as far as I'm aware, no other ex-offender group ever had a chartered credit union. I had a friend of mine, uh, a priest actually in Canada, uh, an Anglican uh, minister, who did charter get one for Canada, but I don't think there was ever another credit union in the United States. Well, this is one of the reasons why we should study history because there has been initiatives like this one right. that actually were revolutionary in their times and needed and are no longer in effect. Correct. But you know, I, I can bet you that in a few years from now somebody's going to come with a come up with a great idea to have a credit union for ex offender. I mean, uh, yeah. sure. so, so in, 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 you know, this is well done. Now we can tell them, well, this is something that Brian was doing ah, many years ago.